Blog Talk Radio. Your journey begins right now. From the west coast of British Columbia to you listening around the world and blasting out into the universe, welcome to tonight's edition of Spaced Out Radio. Call us at 1-607-203-5344. Tweet us at Spaced Out Radio. Find Dave on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio. Or Skype us at Spaced Out Radio. Now, here's your host, Dave Scott. Good evening and welcome to Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, and thank you so much for tuning in to the Space Out Radio Network at spacedoutradio.com. As once again, we come in from the frozen Canadian tundra, battle our way past the wild animals, sidestep Bigfoot, and enter Uncle Jimbo's cabin, stoke the fire, heat this place up, and broadcast you live this Friday night, early Saturday morning, if you were on the East Coast with toothpicks in your eyes. Here at Space Out Radio, we broadcast seven days a week. We want to be your official one-stop shop when it comes to the supernatural, paranormal, ufological, extraterrestrial, and so much more. If you are a social media junkie like I am, you can follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. You can give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show, and you can ask to join our private Spaced Out Radio group and our other group, Podcast Central. On Instagram, you can follow me at Dave Scott SOR, and our website, spaceoutradio.com, you can join our free forum as well. At this time, as we do every night, we'd love to send a quick shout out to our fans taking part in the Space Out Radio chat room, along with our new fans at Paranormal End of the Night and Paranormal Forum. Hey, if you head to our website, spacedoutradio.com, you can check out our free forum. As well, you can check out Cat's Corner. Psychic Catherine Fallman will answer one lucky listener's submitted question per week. Tonight's show is brought to you by Rivulet Reiki and Readings. They provide healings in person or at a distance. Spaced Out Radio listeners receive a 10% discount on pricing. Purpleplates.com to help heal your body, mind, and soul. Drop into their site and heal yourself today. 80,000 people a month read the new Agora newspaper. Find out what's happening around the world regarding the other side of politics, health, supernatural, ufological, paranormal, and so much more. And if you have an iPhone, download the Spirit Story Box. Only costs about a buck. Spirit Story Box, the official ghost hunting app of Spaced Out Radio. Today we say goodbye to one of the strongest voices in extraterrestrial contact. The sixth man to walk on the moon, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who was an astronaut on Apollo 14 in 1971, passed away at 85 years old today. Dr. Mitchell was one of the true voices of the extraterrestrial phenomena. Recently, he had co-founded the Free Experience group dedicated to recording and counseling experiencers and helping shed light on a subject that isn't taken very seriously in the mainstream world and tonight he flies up to the stars himself rest in peace dr mitchell and this ties into tonight's show as well all too well as on the first Friday of each month, we have our Keith Andrews on the show. Keith is an expert on the extraterrestrial experience. In fact, he's been in contact with over 30 different species of ETs. Keith has walked people through their own close encounters, and he has the ability to answer the questions that experiencers may have as they seek for answers to the ultimate question, why them? As per usual, we do not take phone calls during this show. Keith will be live in the Space Out Radio chat room answering your questions as quickly as you can type them in. If you are on another forum listening in as well, or on Twitter, or on Facebook, you can also have a question that can be asked, and I will personally get it to Keith. Type them in all capital letters. Tag me in it so that way I know. I'll pass it on to Keith, and he'll answer it in live time. Friday night. Our Keith Andrews, a little bit of alien talk. Keith, how's it going? Not a bad day, Dave. Thanks for having me once again. You know what? uh... Go ahead. Go ahead. I got to admit, I'm a little nervous tonight. I I am a little nervous tonight. And the big reason why I'm nervous is my father has never heard me do this show. And he is sitting about a foot and a half to the left of me. And I can see him out of my peripheral vision. So senior Spaced Out Radio is sitting in here. And I'm all verklempt a little bit. Like, I feel like I need to perform. I mean, if it's people in the audience, I have no problem with it because I don't see them. But now I have an open audience right here. 
My father is laughing and trying to keep it in, but it's kind of funny nonetheless. I'm proud that he's here, so uh, I'm going to struggle through this one. I can honestly say that. Well, have have you considered juggling while you're sitting there? No, I tried picturing him nude, but that didn't work for me. Yeah, that would. Yeah, probably not. But we'll just leave that that side of it alone. Exactly. Keith, it's good to have you back for your monthly show here on Spaced Out Radio. It's always a pleasure to have you on. We have a bunch of new listeners tuning into us now from Paranormal Into the Night and Paranormal Forum. And for those people who don't know you, I would love it if you could give a little bit of a rundown on your experiences, how you got to this point to seeing and having contact with over 30 different extraterrestrial species. In a, in a nutshell, um, I guess the easiest way to put it is I ended up, the day I was actually born, I ended up actually dying. And at that point, running into, running into the Council of Twelve. And they told me that I was not allowed to pass away. I wasn't allowed to go, to go home, as it were, because I had a massive job to still, uh, to still take care of here. Of course, <laughs> to put it mildly, we we got into an argument because I didn't like the the treatment I'd already had. Um, you know, people that say that birth is a wonderful experience clearly don't remember it. Now, very early in my in my life, um, I ended up being in, becoming a medium. Well, the day I was born, I became a medium, meaning seeing dead people, watching spirits walk through walls, this sort of thing, um, was just plain normal. And by the time I was about a year and a half old, I was already in full contact with, with the off-worlders. I, I separate ETs as off-worlders and ancient races. Off-worlders clearly don't come from Earth. The ancient races are the ones that, though they're not human, evolved here. Now, by the time when I was, um, I guess, probably about six months old, was when I first started dealing with the, with the military, because I grew up on a military base, but I ended up dealing with my labs, military, military laboratories. Um, I'm going to get in trouble for this one in all likelihood, but at five years old, I was murdered. And it was actually a reptilian, a Srizazium, which is your seven and a half to eight and a half foot reptile, reptilian off-worlder, that actually saved my life. And the, the nice part about it from that standpoint, I developed some really good friendships off-world. My first actual positive experience was watching an Earthrise from the deck of a starship. Now, and I know that sounds like science fiction. You know, to, to me, that's just what sounds like science fiction to you, to me, is normal, or to your listeners, I guess, is a better way of putting it. Um, after being taken, I was in, I did end up being taken on top of by my lab by a few off-worlders that were, to say the least, not polite, where I did have some real nasty, real negative um, experiences. And by the way, the, the issue with the MyLab, with the murder and what have you, um, that resulted in PTS, post-traumatic stress, which became a, a very big problem later. Now, over the years, I've ended up dealing with well in excess of 30 different races to the point now where I'm actually working as a, um, where I'm actually working as a liaison, as a consultant to help them come to terms with each other as well as with the human race. You know, so I spend, as it was put to me, I spend more time off world than I, than I do on world some days, you know, sometimes. But um, for those of you that are listening, I do mean both physically and, um, you know, when we talk about telepathic communication, that's just plain normal. But if you know anything about off-world travel, as in the astronaut, you know, the space programs, 
it's a proven fact that they saw that astronauts, when they come back to Earth after an extended period in space, they have a tendency of suffering a potassium crash, which, um, frankly, I've been known to suffer rather substantially. The other part is I end up suffering protein crashes. My diet itself is somewhere close to about 60% of my um about 60% of my diet is actually meat. <laughs> so, you know, I end up like I've got I've got a lot of friends that aren't human but that have shared with me and introduced me to their cultures, to their different ways of looking at things. You know, so it it is a very shall we say a a varied um interaction I deal with. You know, the the big thing that I do want to point out is that most people that talk about reptilians from what I've talked to and from what I've talked to people about seem to combine about six different reptilian races to come up with a picture. And that's one of the big challenges is separating which race you're actually dealing with. I was I was recently talking to somebody who amazingly enough their primary interaction is with an octopod. Okay. As in, what the hell is like that? Sounds, what the hell is a, what the hell is an octopod? I've never heard of that one. That one is quite literally an eight-legged. It, it looks very much like a cephalopod, like a like an octopus, except for the fact they walk upright on land. Granted, they use eight legs or arms, depending on what they're up to. But they are a very curious race, certainly not harmful. And when I found out that this was the person's primary interaction, I'm like, holy mackerel, did you ever pick any an interesting one? In all fairness, that wasn't quite the word I used, but we are on live radio. <laughs> you know, <laughs> something I've noticed here, Dave, and this is this is great, but we're only 10 minutes into the show and the chat room, at least the first scroll bar, is gone. Like it's full. I know. Our, and I and I credit to the group who is now following us, Paranormal Into the Night, because they have brought a ton of new listeners over to us. Uh, they found our show about 10 days ago, and they've been hooked to us ever since. So this is a complete new experience, and they are filling up the chat room every time that uh, we go on the air now. So I give them all the credit. It's not me. Yeah, I didn't figure you got too much on the go to try and have this many pans in the cookie jar. But <laughs> we we digress. <laughs> no. Keith, before before the questions start rolling in, I would like to bring up yeah. a topic that I think is very important to our listeners because we try and pick one topic before we go into each show with you because there's just so much information and the questions will usually start flying back and forth in regards to uh, whatever anybody wants to ask you live in the chat room of the Space Out Radio chat room. So if you're a guest in there, if you would like to ask a question to Keith, you have to log in with a name. You cannot sit there and be in a guest. However, if you're on Paranormal Forum or Paranormal Into the Night, type it in capital letters, tag me in it, and I will monitor those chat rooms to get any questions directly to Keith. So don't be shy. He asks everything. He answers everything. Keith, one of the things that we haven't really talked about in the number of shows that we've done, and this is probably 10 or 11 now, is in regards to the relationships that ETs have with certain people. Why do they continue to take the same people? Well, in a nutshell, it's actually quite simple. Um, when you're when you're looking at the when you look at their way of doing things, genetics plays a very big part. And when they're when an individual, um, if you will, research group finds a particular genetic strand that they're following, right? By following that one person, they can get a better understanding or that one tree or that one bloodline, if you will. They can get a better understanding 
of what is going on, how the environment around that person is having an effect. Okay, so they, and this is why the longer they're with an individual, the more interactive they can become because they learn how to communicate. Just like if you're trying to learn to talk to a deaf person, you know, if, if you don't know sign language and everybody's got their own different way of doing it, um, spending time with that one person, you'll get a better communication line with them than if you're constantly dealing with different people. You know, so, I mean, that's, that primarily is the reason that they go with, with specific individuals or specific bloodlines. Simply because of the of the continuity factor. I understand does that. that make sense? It, it does make sense because I mean you want to form a relationship with anybody. I mean we do it here on humans. We see animals do it in the animal kingdom. It would make sense that what you call the off-worlders or the most of us call extraterrestrials or aliens would do it as well because it's easier to study when you have familiarity. Well, exactly. You know, and the, the hard part, of course, is that because they can't communicate to start with, um, you know, because they've got no, the, the biggest problem with, the, with building a relationship with the off-worlders is that there's nothing solid to work with. Like, you don't have common ground. You know, you know think back, to, think back to, the, to the legendary Gene Roddenberry. He made a staggering statement that was absolutely brilliant when he said that the biggest problem with communicating with off-worlders, with aliens, would be no common ground. Okay. And, we, you know, the, the fact is, just for example, if you hold up a cup of coffee, like a green, a, a green colored cup with normal black coffee in it, and you hand and you hold it out to an alien that you've never dealt with, and you go coffee, you know, and you're holding it out to them. They don't know whether you're talking about the gesture, about the drink, about the color of the cup, or the cup itself, or about something entirely different, because they've got no foundation to work with. And this is this is where you where we come in with the hybridization program which is what the Greys developed to help the different races interact with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's where, you, where, where the real crossover starts to happen, if you will. You know, just where most do, people where, run in. Where do implants then play a role in all of this? Well, think about that in a practical sense. It's easier to track somebody. You've got 7 billion people on the planet going in 8 million different directions. You put an implant in somebody, you can track their location easier. It's just literally that simple. Think of humans when they tag a dolphin, right? They put an electronic beacon in a dolphin so they can figure out where it's going, what its patterns are, you know, depending on the sensitivity of the sensor, it may be taking um, blood pressure readings. It may be taking temperature, you know, temperature readings. They're just, these are just data collectors. Okay. Humans do it all the time to, to what humans think, and I do say think, are lesser animals. Okay. It's just humans have a problem with them being the lesser animal. But that's that's where the where the implants and the you know the bugs and that sort of thing come. Right. I have some questions for you from the Paranormal End of the Night Forum that I am following tonight. KJ is asking, is there plans for them, the extraterrestrials, to eventually show themselves to the rest of us? <laughs> And you said you said that was KJ is asking that. Yes. 
Yeah, KJ, the answer to that is absolutely. Um, and it depends on which race we're talking about. The, the reality of it is they've been trying to work it out for, quite frankly, well, realistically centuries, but we can settle for decades right now. Okay. They do have plans. The problem that they're running into is that white humans have a tendency of shooting at black humans because they're black. Black humans tend to shoot at white humans because they're white. And, you know, the off-worlders are looking at this going, if you're shooting at each other and you're all human and you're trying to kill each other because of skin tone or where you were born, they're looking at it going, this may not be the healthiest place to show up, which is why they hold back the, the visible, you know, the, the grossly visible interactions. You know, when, when people get it through their head that shooting each other is not going to bring peace, and certainly shooting first and asking questions second is not going to result in answers. You know, the the real sad part about it is if, you know, humans have this brilliant idea, um, one, of the, one of the biggest problems that you run into is if the off-worlders were actually to shoot back with the intention of hurting humans, rest assured it would be a very short fight. You know, Watchdog here... Has has just popped into the into the chat room and he's gone with all the known species that Keith is aware of. Do we have a known location of where they're from? The answer is yes in some cases. Now, can I give you exact locations as in star charts and that sort of thing? No, but then I can't tell you where the local grocery store is from where I'm sitting either. <laughs> you know, I leave I leave finding them to them, but. For instance, I have been to the Srazazian homeworld, and that is not a place to go outside and play around. Um, I've also been to the to the Sea Fairies home home city, which, by the way, is on this planet. Um, but you can't exactly get there without their help. You know, when you when you start looking at many of the races. You know, there, there's a lot of them that would like to be known, but there is so much fear out of humans towards humans that, you know, even with the, even with the, with the modern disclosure coming out, the so-called full disclosure, humans are looking at it going, you know, no, it's all, it's all a government argument or, you know, Yes, government is putting out these pictures, but they're just a farce. You know, it's just another smoke screen. So when you think about it, especially with today's makeup, now we had an we had a, a interaction at the Experiencer Speak conference last August. August? Yeah. Um and we had Pleiadians Pleiadian hybrids show up. There is so much rumor out there that there are pictures that I have posted of the of the people, and the reality is I haven't posted a single picture. The other reality is there isn't a photograph in existence that will actually show the fact that they're kind of that their pigment changes. Now we do have some videos that show them at different points in the video with different skin tones, which does kind of lead to the idea that the skin tone changes. You know, but think about it this way. Nords have been walking amongst us, amongst the humans on this planet, for centuries, and nobody's noticed. Okay, Pleiadian hybrids are rare, absolutely. When you take a look at the ancient race, some of the ancient races, the fairy folk, some of them have been amongst people for centuries again. But the human race, for all of its self-proclaimed awareness, really does miss an awful lot of information. 
you know, so that's, you know, when you're, when we're talking about, are they interested in showing themselves? Certainly think about it this way. They tried originally to do so with the governments of the world. Now there's a neat little rumor and it's actually accurate that Hitler was in touch with off worlders during world war two. Well, the good news, I guess, is they are, he was. The bad news that nobody talks about, so to speak, and I don't know if this is bad news, but the other side of that is so was every other major superpower at the time. Okay, they made all kinds of contracts, all kinds of agreements with the off-worlders of various, of various species, you know, various races, and the governments broke most of the contracts. So the off-worlders turned around and they went to the corporations, figuring these are the people that can get to the to the masses. These are the people that will pass on the information we're gifting them with. And what the off-worlders and the ancient races found was that the owners of the corporations were so caught and picking greedy that they wouldn't release the information. Now, I remember just a little while ago, some human bought the rights to a to an AIDS virus cure and then jacked the price through the roof. And everybody figured that that person was an absolute monster, right? Because they were jacking the price so high. Well, you might want to take a look at the fact that there are cures out there that the corporations have, not the least of which is the cure for cancer. And the reason they don't release it and I know I get in trouble for this one, but that's okay, is because of the fact that it makes too much money to keep people sick. So they don't bother. As a result of this, the off-worlders have turned to getting in touch with the, with the lesser known people, with the individuals, with the fringe people that may be able to get their information out. Keith, I'm going to get you to hold on. Keith, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we're going to take our first break of the night. We are talking with our Keith Andrews. He is our resident expert on extraterrestrial contact. We are talking relationships with ETs tonight. And, of course, Keith is on the first Friday of every month. You're listening to Space Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be right back after this break. This is Patrick Webster Small, and I'm going to bring you the Webster Phenomena right here on Spaced Out Radio, Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Every week, I'm going to bring you the freshest information on the globe. I'm bringing you guys the truth, extraterrestrials in the sky, prophecy, chemtrails, rainbow spot, the seventh angel, biblical skies, ancient gods, ghosts, spirits, see it, hear it. So let's do this every Monday night. I'll see you back here at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the place have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit. And expect a miracle. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Did you know that Spaced Out Radio is live seven days a week? This is Jim Tyson, host of Spaced Out Weekend. You can listen to my show, Spaced Out Weekend, every Saturday and Sunday night starting at 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific. On Spaced Out Weekend, we like to delve into the paranormal, even the newest technologies that have enhanced modern-day ghost hunting. And sometimes, we'll get a little creative and dabble into the crypto world, UFOs, and much, much more. 
So tune in at www.spacedoutradio.com on the weekends and listen to me, Jim Tyson, on Spaced Out Weekend. Hi there, this is Jolene with Rivulet Reiki and Readings, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivulet r and r or my Facebook page, Rivulet R and R, to set up an appointment for relaxation, Reiki, or readings, no matter where you are. Spaced Out Radio listeners will also receive ten percent off their first visit. It's time for you to make time for you. The Spaced Out Radio Network can be found at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott. Here, you can join the latest on our weekly shows and news from around the world involving UFOs, cover-ups, cryptids, ghosts, and more. Read articles from our very talented staff and check out our weekly tarot card reading from psychic Catherine. You can also sign up for free on our forum and tell us about your experiences. SpacedOutRadio.com. Always live, always interactive. Ready to find out what's flying up in the sky? Me too. Hi there, this is Rich Giordano. Please join me every Sunday night at 7 for the AZ UFO Show. It's a fast and compelling two-hour show on UFOs, extraterrestrials, conspiracy theories, and much more. Every week we will have great guests and great topics to try and answer the ultimate question, are we alone in this universe or not? So tune in to the AZ UFO Show with me, Rich Giordano, right here on the Spaced Out Radio Network at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with Dave and his guests? Learn more at spacedoutradio.com for the latest news, features, photos, and articles. Spacedoutradio.com is where you can stay up to date on what's happening around the world and up in the stars. And now, back to Dave Scott. Welcome back for the second half hour of Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Space Out Radio Network. Quick shout out to everyone listening in the Space Out Radio chat room. Make sure your questions like Watchdog and Perrier Daryls are in capital letters. If you have them for Keith, he is in the chat room as well, ready to take your questions. If you're in the paranormal into the night or paranormal forum, please feel free to put them in capital letters. Tag me in it so that way I can know or when not to ask a question. Very loud indeed in the paranormal into the night room tonight. Thank you so much, guys, for being so awesome in what you are doing. Same as the Paranormal Forum as well. Love that group. Thank you for your support as well. Hey, tomorrow night and Sunday, we give the keys to the cabin to Uncle Jimbo James Tyson. He'll be in for space a weekend. Me, I go wandering off into the wilderness for a couple of days and then come back for Monday night at 10 p.m. Pacific, 1 a.m. Eastern. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Space Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Space Out Radio Show. You can also ask to join our private Space Out Radio group and our other group, Podcast Central. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R. And, of course, our website is spaceoutradio.com. Tonight we are talking to R. Keith Andrews. He is our resident ET expert. He comes on the first Friday of every month to talk something different about extraterrestrials. Tonight we're talking about relationships. Do we have relationships with extraterrestrials? Are they part of us? Well, Keith, we bring you back in here because Bill in Paranormal Into the Night has a question, and I, or he made a comment that I think is a great question. Should people okay. who've never had contact initiate contact should they wish that contact upon them well that's actually a really a really intelligent question and i realized that we i realized bill it was just a comment that you made but this gives you an idea of how especially on spaced out radio we we sort of try and watch when i'm on the show anyway we try and watch comments going by because many times people are afraid to ask a question now, the answer to that is, by all means, if you, if you really do desire to make contact, um, certainly put it out there, and there's any number of ways that I've heard of people doing it. I don't have a specific way to tell you, here's how to make contact. The one caution for those who have not made contact, they haven't run into the off-worlders, 
and they're basically curious. Keep in mind when you're putting it out there, when you're thinking about making contact, for pity's sakes, make certain you focus on making contact with our allies or at least with people that have the best interest of the human race in mind. There are races out there that are, most of the races are essentially neutral. But unfortunately, that also means that they don't really understand how humans operate. So there's a lot of experiments they do or a lot of, you know, um, if you will, samples they take to discover how humans operate. You know, there are a limited number of real, ally, real allies that are out there, and those are great people. But... The problem with just randomly going, I want to have an ET contact and let's try and summon somebody, is that if you get to get the attention of some groups, one of the most volatile of which would be the Teclex, which are a, what I grew up knowing as Teclex. They're a four and a half to five and a half foot raptor like reptile. Um, but frankly, they find humans actually kind of tasty. And if you get their attention, it may not turn out as enjoyable as you would like. But, you know, the reality is they're trying to make contact. The off-worlders and the ancient races on the whole are looking for people that are willing or open-minded enough to make contact. But, you know, so absolutely make the effort. Let them know you're interested in contact. Just keep it clear in your heads, you know, that you are aiming for a positive experience, not a positively painful one. Okay, the the nice little part about it is that as long as people keep seeking to make contact, the odds of making contact for somebody in a cognitive standpoint actually climb rather rather drastically. Well, most I think people, Bill, that yeah, most people, Keith. Though when they, I mean, when you start throwing out like raptor style or ant style or mantid beings or or reptilians, that seems so far out there for most people who seem to coordinate their thoughts and their ideas behind grays. Grays seem yep. to be everywhere. I've seen grays, you you've know. seen grays, and many others have. But everything always seems to focus back on them and that relationship with human beings. What's your theory on the grays? Well, the grays are pure scientists. Okay, on the whole, that is what they do. They examine, they test, they take samples, they bug people as in they tag them and they send them back on their way. The greys are the race that actually built the, um, they actually designed the hybridization program that enables the different races to communicate comfortably with each other. Okay, the other reason that greys are so prolific Frankly, we can go back, and I forget what year it was, but the first real quintessential UFO show, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, sort of etched the grays into everybody's mind on a cultural level. You know, which is one of the reasons why most people um, do tend to spot them first. Right. Even the people that didn't watch the show, it has had a lasting impact. But the fact that the Greys are the scientists, they're the ones that know how to pull people out of out of a room without a problem. They're the ones that know how to tag, how to, you know, improvise on the run, how the how to deal with humans. You know, that's essentially that's why they're the most the most common, the most prolific, if you will. Nisa, here. Nisa is asking in Paranormal Into the Night, ask for a positive experience, not a positively painful one. It's more of a comment, but that's 
in reality what it is. You have to make sure you draw the line when you ask for that contact that you are of wanting a, a sound experience, not just an experience which could lead to disaster rea- in reality. Absolutely. Absolutely, because when you go an experience, well, let's face it, if you want an experience of driving, you know, of just driving a car or of being in a car, that opens an awful lot of doors. So having an experience just without being clear, because understand a lot of these races, they monitor the, they either monitor the thought line or the, the thought waves or they track communication lines, right? So that, you know, that's where we end up with, you have to be clear with what you're looking for, you know, and, you know, watchdog in the, in the group, he, he says, which group wants to help us humans? Well, the, the big one, and literally they're big, Cerezozians do. Those are, as I said, the seven and a half to eight and a half foot reptilians. The Nordics are very interested in helping people, as are the Arcturons. Um, when you're, you know, the Mobians are, are quite interested in helping humans, although they're a little bit more edgy around humans' predilection for war. You know, you've got some of the fairy folk. There's certainly a, a group of the, of the Teclex. That's why the Teclex have a, have a civil war going on. When we take a look at the Galactic Consortium itself, which is the overall governing body of the local area, they certainly want to help humans, but they don't want to interfere. Right. So, I mean, there's the, when, we, when we talk about the 30-some-odd races, actually, I think I've got 40 of them right now that I was listing, um, most of them are neutral. They really aren't interested in, they're not worried about helping humans, but they're also not interested in, um, you know, in hurting them either. See, I, I get a kick out of, out of Lion here. Lion goes, reptilians want to help, and then he starts to laugh. Well, I find that kind of an entertaining concept as to why the laughter. Aside from unless you, if you watch... The um, if you watch the old, I think it was in the '80s show V, it showed the reptilians were here to conquer. Well, let's face it: if we take a look at the Rosazians themselves, if they wanted to conquer, we got to put this in perspective. These people, on in melee only, in other words, in hand-to-hand combat only, and this is just one weapon. Humans use a mace, which is about, back in the Middle Ages, used a mace, which was basically a two- or three-pound chunk of metal on the end of a club. Now, Srizazians also had their melee weapons, their hand-to-hand weapons. And their equivalent of the mace was, simply put, a medicine ball size by a pile of metal. <laughs> so when you, when you look at that side of it, you really do have have to understand that if the reptilians actually wanted to wipe out the race, especially wipe out humans, rest assured it would be a short fight. So, yeah, they really are here to help, unlike the government in a lot of cases. Uh-oh, going to get in trouble for that one. You know, the, the reality of it is humans are not the top of the totem pole. You know, there was there was another another question that um, that Watchdog had put out. He asked if the offworlders have a supreme leader or an overall leader, and if that leader was God. Well, the answer is yes. They have. When we look at the consortium, they absolutely have. Um, they absolutely have leaders. They've got a council that runs the consortium. That is not the same thing as what they call their spiritual god. Okay. Every race has their own religious belief. Okay. Every every relationship or every race has their own 
people or their own belief structure, whether it's a single God or multiple gods, but virtually invariably, even with multiple deities, they still believe in one overall God. Okay. So one of the, you know, the, the biggest problem that you run into is, you know, when you're, when you're looking at who runs or who guides the, the different alien races, well, it's kind of like asking which human, you know, which, who guides or who leads humans. Okay. There are all kinds of groups of people that get together to try and help. But in most cases, there isn't just one individual leader that says, this is what we are doing. Although there are a few races where that does actually work. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> Dave, I don't know if you've, well, I'm pretty certain you noticed. Daryl has put a, a YouTube link. Now, I'm not silly enough myself with my technological capacity. You know, if this were a holographic interface, that'd be great. But she's put a link in to take a look at something. And just for people's edification, the reason I don't try and look up links while I'm on the show is because the odds are I'll crash the computer in the process. <laughs> so I really am not going to, I'll have to take a look at that later and get back, get back to it at a later date. I, I think that's fair. Okay, <laughs> you know, right. Well, you, 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 go ahead. I have a couple. I have a couple questions coming from Paranormal Into the Night tonight for you. This one from Nisa. Have you ever had any contact with extraterrestrials that are currently residing in our oceans? Yep. <laughs> How was that for blunt? Um, yeah, the fairy folk, the mare folk, a number of the amphibs. Even the water elementals that are here I've dealt with. You know, and, you know, the, the fairy folk the, that are the underwater ones are an interesting group. And when they first started trying to deal with humans, um, it wasn't quite so well because they didn't really realize that humans couldn't breathe underwater. And when they figured that out, then they developed a way of getting them to breathe underwater. You know, they figured, okay, they need oxygen, so no problem. And they took, you know, they got them the oxygen and then found out that when you get down to about three miles under, even if they've got oxygen, humans are just too frail. Okay, humans get crushed at that kind of depth. So they developed a an interesting chemical, if you will, it's actually a, an oxygen-carrying gel that they literally infuse into the human body through the, you know, through the lungs. People that have had, that have woken up coughing and sputtering and they end up spitting out this kind of an odd viscous gel, kind of a bluish or a, it, usually it's a real pale blue color. The odds are you've been taken by a, by the by the fairy folk, okay, by the sea fairies, okay, because that gel is what st it still enables people to breathe. It doesn't have any lasting side effects. It doesn't have any lasting, um, you know, it doesn't have any. It doesn't do any damage, right? The worst side effect to it is it leaves a lousy taste in your mouth when you spit it out. But it's what stops people from dying. Okay, it's it's what actually maintains the stability of the human genome so it doesn't get crushed. Okay. So, you know, that's that's how those are some of the some of the waterborne, if you will, and most of those are ancient races, by the way, that are waterborne. Now, trying to deal with a waterborne elemental, well, <laughs> let's face it, they're a little hard to communicate with. But the best one that I ever saw, they actually depicted it really well on the show called The Abyss. Okay, and that was, I don't know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, I think. Um, 
Yeah, and, and Daryl is saying that viscous manure stuff I was talking about is kind of like the consistency of a snail or a clam. And, yeah, it really is. Granted, a mushy one, but it's pretty much about the right idea. Right. I have another question from Dino in Paranormal Into the Night. Watchers over our planet, other extraterrestrial beings in check, and how are they protecting us? Well, the answer is <laughs> yes. That is actually what the, first of all, what the consortium is for, is to make sure that for the most, you know, as much as possible, the planet is essentially, yes, people come and visit, they're allowed, they come, they tag, that sort of thing. But the consortium does govern the idea of making sure the planet is not taken over or, for that matter, overrun. Okay. Um, the you know, Struzazians are a little bit more hands-on. And if there is a problem, they will go to war. They will fight to keep people, to keep unwanted off. Okay. You know, so it it depends on the race, but that's a couple of, that's two of the ways that are dealt with by literally restricting access, by, you know, enforcing those kinds of concessions. Now, there is a group of watchers that is inbound right now. And when we talk about them being watchers, I mean quite literally, they are watchers. They will see what happens, they will watch the interactions, and they will do nothing. They are literally watchers. They record what's going on, and they've got multiple planets they do this with, where they literally watch what is going on. Okay, but the biggest reason that off-worlders don't, on the whole, step in and do that other thing that people keep asking me, why don't they come down and clean this mess up? Well, it's because you guys keep making it. You know, you've been told so many times, quit shooting at each other, it doesn't bring peace. You want to heal each other, that's a great idea. How about releasing the things that you've already been given? How about not putting toxins into your foods and then wondering why your kids are having troubles? You know, it's just a thought. So, you know, when we're talking about protecting the planet, the reason, if you go back to, I believe it was 1986, but I might be off on the year, when right smack in the middle of, um, right smack in the middle of the Cold War, and the U.S. military had actually armed the way of the silos. They were getting ready to actually launch nuclear war. The off-worlders came down and shut down the nuclear warheads. Now, they did it without even trying. Like, there was no effort to it at all. So, if humans are going to do something that's going to destroy major chunks of the planet then absolutely they'll stop it from happening. But if it's just humans trying to wipe out major chunks of humans, well, you know, get it together, people. You're still human. Quit poisoning the planet, and maybe you'll get better reactions out of the off-worlders that you're trying to get a hold of. The other thing you got to remember when you're trying to make contact with these people is, for pity's sakes, what's your reason? Are you trying to do it to say, hey, I saw a, a strange-looking person? Are you trying to do it to actually make contact and interact, or are you looking to get a hold of technology because you figure you're going to be able to make an extra buck? Okay, they do actually have very well-trained individuals monitoring what your true intention is, not necessarily what your intention is when it comes to dealing, when it comes to telling other people what your thought is. Okay, so, you know, this is this is one of the biggest issues around trying to figure out what the watchers are doing. Keith, I have one question from Twitter coming through right now from Exogenesis. 
Wouldn't an ET landing and telling us in person how to act make a bigger impact on our actions? Not in the slightest. Think about it. Um, it would for a very short period of time, okay? But you think about it. They have had, you know, you look at the just recently, there was, there was a, well, heck, just recently, let's just go right to showing up at the, at the Experience or Speak conference. Inside the building, we had 20, um, we had 20 independent witnesses plus hotel guests that were phoning the hotel to find out what these people were doing in the building. And people immediately claimed and really pushed the issue of it all being a publicity stunt. Now, if a Nord shows up, a Nord looks like a human. You know, granted, six foot plus, built like a brick wall. Okay, gorgeous as all get out, extremely well put together, long blonde hair. They look human. If one of them says, I'm an off-worlder, you're going to look at them and go, yeah, right, prove it. Well, the only way you're going to prove it is dissect them, and somehow they don't actually appreciate that. (laughs) You know, so, sure, landing a ship would absolutely be, it would absolutely make a start, except for with modern technology and human paranoia, it would be very quickly classified as a publicity stunt from Hollywood or one of the other major, you know, major motion picture firms or a government special ops showing up. People on the whole wouldn't take it as an actual off world or showing up. And the sad part is the ones that see it nine times out of 10 open fire. You know, Mm-hmm. And rest assured, with some of these races, you open fire, that's going to be a bad outcome. Bad indeed. Keith, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. We are going to take our break at the top of the hour. Our guest tonight is our ET expert, our Keith Andrews. He's comes on the first Friday of every month to talk ET with you, the value lister, in chat rooms. So I'm going to get you to hold on, sit tight. And we'll be back with more R. Keith Andrews right after this break. You're listening to Space Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. Talk to you in a few minutes. The Phoenix Lights, Roswell, secret military aircraft, flying saucers. Let's check out the sky together. Hi, this is Rich Giordano, host of the AZ UFO Show right here on the Spaced Out Radio Network. Every Sunday night at 7, we hit the airwaves to talk about the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects and more. We want to hear your stories. Maybe you've seen what many others have seen. Only one way to find out, the AZ UFO Show on Sunday nights on the Spaced Out Radio Network on spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is James Tyson, host of Spaced Out Weekends, and I know you're enjoying tonight's show with Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio. I just wanted to remind you that Spaced Out Radio continues on the weekends with me. On Spaced Out Weekend, we hit the airwaves at www.spacedoutradio.com starting at 10 p.m. Pacific, 1 a.m. Eastern. We have great guests with interesting chats regarding all things paranormal, supernatural, cryptozoological, and much, much more. So tune in to Spaced Out Weekend and give us a listen. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the place have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit and... Expect a miracle. Need a break but don't have the time? Tired of life's running around? Hi, this is Jolene from Rivulet Relaxation and Readings. Let me help you in your time of need. From Reiki to Realm Readings, I can help provide you therapy for your mind, body, and soul. Check out my website at rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr. And if you're a listener of Spaced Out Radio, receive 10% off your first session. Rivulet Relaxation and Readings. And don't forget to give my Facebook page a like. 
It's time for you to make some important time for you. The Spaced Out Radio Network can be found at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott. Here you can join the latest on our weekly shows and news from around the world involving UFOs, cover-ups, cryptids, ghosts, and more. Read articles from our very talented staff and check out our weekly tarot card reading from psychic Catherine. You can also sign up for free on our forum and tell us about your experiences. SpacedOutRadio.com. Always live, always interactive. The Webster Phenomena airs on Spaced Out Radio on Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. I'm your host, Patrick Webster Small, and I discovered extraterrestrials in the atmosphere, which led me to more discoveries developing the Webster Phenomena, which is the occurrence of extraterrestrials throughout nature. I will explain the Webster Phenomena and all my recent discoveries every Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time, right here on Spaced Out Radio. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Want to call in to Spaced Out Radio? You can. 1-607-203-5344. You can tweet us at Spaced Out Radio or send us a message on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio. And now, back to the show, here's Dave Scott. Welcome back for the second hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. Always a pleasure to be here live with you. Seven days a week we do this show, my show, Monday through Friday, 10 p.m. Pacific, 1 a.m. Eastern. Uncle Jimbo steps into the cabin while I wander off into the wilderness for the weekend. He's at 10 p.m. Pacific, 1 a.m. Eastern on Saturdays. Sundays, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern is when he gets things going for Spaced Out Weekend. I'll be back in the hot seat on Monday. Hey, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so, at Spaced Out Radio. You can give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can also join our Spaced Out Radio group, as well as Podcast Central. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott, S-O-R, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. Now, we bring in Keith Andrews once again. He is our resident ET expert. We bring him in the first Friday of every month. Our next show with him will be... Friday, March 4th, and then the following month, it would be Friday, April 1st. So it'll be an April Fool's show for Keith. Yeah, we're going to have some fun with that one, Keith, when it happens. Keith, I want to get things started because we have a lot of questions piling up here. Let's start off with Watchdog in the Spaced Out Radio chat room where he is asking, have they or can they help us humans with cures for sickness? This is a great question. It is, and it's about as simple as you get. The answer is yes. They've already turned over the cure to to most of the cancers. They've already turned over the cure to most of the nervous disorders. Um, they've even turned over the cure to many of the hereditary glitches that are only the, that mankind's own toxins are creating. The problem is they turn them over to the corporations. Now, turning them over to the corporations was a real brilliant idea. It would have gotten them out. Unfortunately, the people running the corporations are greedy, and I could say a few other words that go along with that, and have decided that your health, the general population, isn't free. The, money, the, the cures were turned over for free with the understanding that they would be turned over to the population. Okay, so much for that idea. So can they help? Certainly. They have also tried to help with some of the social paradigms. Only humans have this brilliant idea that if it's not fear-based, it's not going to work. You know, the the ironic part 
Um, no, actually, <laughs> Jarhead goes, and they gave us the formula for Viagra. That was actually mankind's development. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, but that's beside the point. Okay, but yeah, they 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 can and they have offered certain cures, certain medical technologies. Unfortunately, talk to the corporations; they're the ones holding on to most of them. Not all of them, because they have turned over. I'm in the process myself of putting something together. I got handed the handed the instructions for. But before, because I don't have the wherewithal to develop it, or more to the point, to afford to build exactly what I need, it's taking me a little bit of time because I'm not turning it over to anybody until I've tested it on me first. Because quite frankly, if it kills me, there's no way I'm going to turn it over to somebody else. You know, but... Do they try and help? Certainly. But you might want to talk to the leaders and the and the corporations that have them. Uh, okay. Now, a healthy, the, you know, so, a, a, a healthy society is not a profitable society. That's where they're dead wrong. If they have, if society is healthy and is working together and is helping each other and it has the energy. They produce faster. They produce more higher quality materials, higher quality products that can be sold at a better ratio, less cost production, less training involved, and the corporations would make actually substantially more money. And this has been proven. But mankind seems to be a little slow on remembering things like this. How's that for backwards? Not too bad. Keith, I got some questions from Paranormal Into the Night. They're lining up here for you. We'll start off with Bill's question. Supreme beings, is there one that can overrule any other alien species out there whether or not they come down to harm us or help us? Well, there's a lot that claim that ability, but there is always, always, always somebody higher up the totem pole. So is there a supreme being overall that can just flat out go, no? The answer to that is no. Now, I should put it this way. In this sector... In the soul system, the one that we are in, there is an overall that says this is what you're allowed to do in this solar system. However, there are races above that one that can tell it what can be done or what they will let it get away with. So mm-hmm. if, if if you're asking, the, the thing is, Bill, if you're asking is there a top of the totem pole that is absolute over everything bar nothing, the answer is no. Who is the ruler, Keith? Well, of this sector? Yes. I grew up knowing Erzlin, well, knowing her, him, it, take your pick, it's actually an amalgamation, Lindana. And that was, originally, that was two different spirits that built the planet together for the purpose of experiencing the physical world in a family-type unit. Now, they are overall, in this area, the ones that watch over this planet and go, this is what we want, you know, this is what we designed it for. That being said... They do not come down and go, oh, we're going to tell you that you're absolutely not allowed to do it because the real big issue there is this funny thing called freedom of choice. But they do point everybody in the right direction. For instance, going, um, you know, you know, giving the right people the insights to say, you know, if you do what you're talking about, you're going to destroy your own people. Sad to say humans have still got it in their idea that they are the top of the totem pole, at least the ones, you know, at least the ones in, in, so to speak, power, and they don't tend to listen. You know, you take a look at the spiritual leaders, and I don't care what religion we're talking about, 
They talk about a God being all powerful. And they, of course, you're supposed to fear it, which makes no sense. But 80% of the wars in history are based on religion. Now, the supreme God, as it were, said, get along. He didn't say, get along, but only with the people that believe the exact same thing you do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, is there a supreme one-on-one? The answer is no, but at least not above everything. But in this area, the answer is yes. Lisa is asking, do you then believe in God? Yep. Absolutely. But let's be clear on that. If you take a normal westernized human from the United States or from Canada, doesn't matter, even anywhere in Europe, okay, give them a Bic lighter, like one of those mini Bics, mm-hmm. send them into the Congonesian jungle amongst the pygmies. And have that person mutter a couple of words while they conceal that Bic lighter in their hand. And they flick it so they end up with fire coming out of the palm of their hand. That Western person, as far as the pygmies are concerned, is a god. Okay. Now, do I believe in a higher power? Do I believe in what what most humans would consider god? I absolutely do. Okay. Lord knows I don't have a lot of choice. I ran into the man. Well, man, woman, I don't know which way you want to call it because it's all of the above. Okay. What's the next one? I I don't know how else to answer that one there, Dave. (laughs) No, I, I I I think you're fine on that. Let me get to the next one here on Paranormal Into the Night. This one comes from KJ. What is the lifespans of extraterrestrials? Oh, boy, now there's a varied answer. (laughs) Let me put it this way. Um, If you take a look at the Nords, they're about the same as humans. Greys live on the whole about half the length of humans, so about the 40 to 50 year mark, give or take. I don't know about it. Now, why, pray tell, would you have this guy in the room? This Let me backwards see. show. Oh, guy yeah. Bubba He's, from backwards show. Yeah, we'll get rid of him right now. Bubba always likes to come in and try and be a little bit of an asshole, so we'll just boot him from the room right now. There we go. He's gone. Sorry. (laughs) You know, anyway, um, as far as race, as far as ages go, um, simply put, Trezazians on the whole, um, very few of them ever die of old age, but you are looking at several hundred years. Usually they die because of other causes. If you take a look at Laborians, which are a feline race, um, well, simply put, they have a lifespan in their eyes about the same as humans, about 100 years. But understand, every day they're alive is a 1,000 years of man's. Okay, so when you're looking at a Laborian and you ask how old it is and it says a year, you're actually looking at, a, at, a, at an individual that is roughly 365,000 years old by human definition. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are talking about a fairly extensive lifespan. Right. And, of course, you've got, like, your your fairy folk, most of them live about two centuries. Right. If you look at the, if you look at the, at the little folk, right, and I am referring to what most people no, the colloquial term for them is dwarves, do actually get to be about the three or 400 year mark. You know, and of course, when you start, you know, you look at the, at the Brahmin, which are basically a bovine race. Um, and yeah, very much bullheaded, rest assured. Not the most easy to get, the easiest to get along with. They only live about 40 years mm-hmm. by, by human standards. You know, so most of the races are in the same ballpark. 
Right. But you do have the odd ones that are extremes. I think the Laborians are probably the, the oldest as far as individuals go. Because, frankly, their regenerative, their regenerative capacity is, is incredible. <coughs> Keith, I have another question here from the Space O, or make that the paranormal end of the night. And this one comes from Kathy. Can we as humans tell who they are when they walk among us? And what percentage of them are here? <laughs> Well, now the percentage is a problem because if you're talking about, you see, where I run into, into a problem with percentages is if you're talking about how many people on Earth, how many of the humans you see walking around are off-worlders, um, frankly, I wouldn't put it at a tenth of a percent. The greater majority of people on this planet that you see walking around are human. Simple, straightforward. Can you tell the answer is yes, but you got to know what you're looking for. Okay. Like, one of the biggest misconceptions, really to clear it up, Pleiadians, that people keep talking about being these tall, blonde people, those are not Pleiadians. Those are Nords. Natural, true Pleiadians cannot survive on this show. On this show. No, they really can't, but they can't survive on this planet. The toxins in the air of this planet will kill a true Pleiadian because true Pleiadians have translucent blue skin and they're bald. They are by no means these blonde giants. Those are Nords. Um, if you take a look at the like the the fairy folk and the half you know the hybrid fairy folk or half breeds if you will you know one of the biggest giveaways iron you know, ironically enough is decidedly pointed ears and really really fine features yeah you know, like almost almost carved okay um there are a couple of a couple of people that you that you look at a couple of races. I ran into a Martokian here one day, and you know he looked absolutely human except his skin was green and he had reverse knees. So you kind of watch what people are when you're watching people. There are distinct differences, but the thing people have to remember is just because they look different does not mean they're a threat to anybody. And for pity's sakes, can we let go of the idea that anybody's here to take over the human government? The human government, humans are screwing that up well enough. They don't need help from off-worlders. Indeed. Indeed. Let me ask you another question, Keith. This one again coming from Paranormal Into the Night. Dino is asking, sure. what is your purpose of your involvement with these extraterrestrials? And why have they chosen you to speak for them in regards of knowledge? Well, the, my purpose is actually very simple. Uh, well, to state it as simple to make it happen is another problem. It is literally to help people understand two major factors. One, the, the, the off-worlders on the whole are not here to cause a war. They're not here to kill everybody they're not here to wipe out the planet okay the off-worlders are here for a very simple reason and that is to help bring mankind up to speed mankind is leaving earth well more to the point mankind has left earth and is entering into a world into a society they don't understand so the off-worlders are here to try and help people understand some of the rules that actually apply that must be followed, whether or not they like them. The reason that, and I sort of have to extrapolate on this, the reason I was chosen is because, frankly, I don't have a prejudice. 
I don't care what somebody's, you know, I care about it, but um, what somebody's income bracket is or what their gender, what their appearance, what their social background, it doesn't matter to me where it comes to treating them as equals, okay? It doesn't matter to me what size somebody is. It doesn't bother me as long as the people treat each other, and specifically me in most cases, with reasonable respect. Now, I don't mind in the slightest somebody looking down on me, especially when they're eight feet tall. Okay, I mean, I'm only five foot seven. I can't hold that against them. But I do have a problem, and this is one of the biggest reasons that they, that as near as I can figure, they don't have, they like working with me, is if somebody starts treating anybody in a disrespectful fashion because of the fact that they're different, I will speak up about it. Like this guy that we uh, that that you just kicked out of the room. That kind of behavior is totally unacceptable in this environment. Now, wherever that guy's from, maybe that's normal in his area. You must respect the uh, the rules of the land in which you are. In this case, the show, you know, in Space Out Radio, there's certain rules of protocol of of decorum that should be followed. And, you know, the off-worlders have come to understand that I really don't care what they think of themselves as long as they realize that I don't see them as better than me. They just happen to be bigger. They have more technological know-how. And granted, they can rip me apart limb from limb. They're stronger than I am does not mean they're better. The Greys are phenomenal scientists. Just because they've got more brain power and more understanding of science does not mean that they're better than I am. Because where I've got the strength that they're missing is I understand how the social interaction can come together. And that is far more powerful than any gun ever will be. Because a gun will kill if it's got somebody behind it. So for those of you worrying about are we going to remove guns from anybody? No, but you might want to learn how to use them properly. Now, you know, so, I mean, that's essentially, that's why, as near as I can figure, I was approached. Uh, okay. And obviously the Sersosians saw something in me because, well, they're the ones that actually pulled me out of the fire, so to speak. They're the ones that put me back together after I got murdered. And rest assured, if you want to find proof on that, go to the military base and find it so we can both have it. <laughs> I get a kick out of you. Like, Watchdog here has, has thrown an extra question in. You know, mm -hmm. what are their intentions for diving into our waters? Is it bases for hiding their visitors or are they exploring? Well, I don't know if you want to call it hiding, but yes, they are exploring. They also have this neat little thing that hydroelectrics, they found another way of doing it without destroying the water. So recharging works quite well. And most of their bases have water out in, in some races cases. The access point to their base is underwater because, well, humans don't tend to go there that much. I got time for one more question before we got to go to our final break of the night, Keith. So we were talking with our Keith Andrews, our resident ET expert. Claudia is asking from Paranormal Into the Night, how do aliens then reproduce? Do they reproduce like us, or do they come from a test tube? Well, that sort of depends on the race. Reptilians, quite frankly, lay eggs. Most of the reptilians that I've run into do lay eggs. Um, if you look at the Nords, well, it's very much like us, same as the Arcturons. Okay, if you take a look at the insectivorids like the, the mantis, they have a tendency of laying eggs. Now, the amoeboid, well, quite frankly, they just simply separate. They simply become more. If you take a look at the elementals, they do it the same way. They simply increase their energy levels to the point that they split. 
Okay. Um, you know, when, when you take a look at Laborians, well, yes, technically we would say that they do reproduce like humans. But I will tell you this. You don't want to get involved with them on a dating site because they will physically rip you limb from limb in the process. Not intentionally. Wonderful. It just kind of works out that way. Wonderful. Pleasant thoughts right there. Remind <laughs> me to stay off the website, plentyofaliens.com. <laughs> Keith, we're going to hop out for our final. I'm going to get you to hold on for the final time tonight, Keith. We're going to hop out for our final break here. We're listening to our Keith Andrews tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He's our resident ET expert. We're into our final break of the night. When we come back, more of your questions being answered by our Keith Andrews. You are listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be right back. Want to find out what's coming up on the Spaced Out Radio Network? Go to spacedoutradio.com where you can find our daily list of shows and guests appearing throughout the week. Want to tell us your story? Be sure to sign up for the Spaced Out Forum for free. Maybe you have a psychic question. Drop in and say hi to Catherine in Cat's Corner. Spacedoutradio.com, your 24-hour source for UFOs, ghosts, conspiracies, and more. Check it out today. Are you one of many who's had a UFO or ET experience? Listen up. The AZ UFO Show is on every Sunday night at 7 on the Spaced Out Radio Network. We talk about UFO sightings across the globe, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, and more with me, Rich Giordano. I want you to know what's going on in the skies above you, so tune in to the AZ UFO Show on Spaced Out Radio Network on spacedoutradio.com right before Spaced Out Weekend. Our show is literally out of this world. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the place have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit and... Expect a miracle. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Brand new discovery beats NASA. This is Patrick Webster Small bringing you the Webster Phenomena every Monday night at 8 p.m. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to talk about amazing stuff. Have amazing guests. That's all that is, man. You know the rest says ET's up in the sky. I'm going to tell you which way and why. And we're going to have a little combo about these ETs in the sky. We're going to chill. This is Patrick Webster Small, and I'll be seeing you every Monday night at 8 p.m. Pacific Time. Write it down on Spaced Out Radio. Is the 24-hour world starting to wear you down? Let me, from Rivulet Reiki and Ratings, lend you a hand. Hi, this is Jolene. And if you're in need of Reiki or a realm rating, come to my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivulet r and r and let us help you out at rivulet i specialize in healing your body mind and soul no matter where you are and be sure to check out the rivulet r and r facebook page for your best deals remember it's time for you to make some time for you hi there this is jim tyson host of spaced out weekend when you've had a busy week and you're just wanting to chill out and relax how about listening into my show that's right spaced out weekend I focus on the paranormal, the arcane, I even dip into the techie side of things, and much, much more. And I would love for you to come in and check it out. Remember, Spaced Out Radio goes seven days a week. Dave Scott, Monday through Friday, and me, Jim Tyson, rolling through the weekends. I look forward to having you stop by for a listen every Saturday and Sunday night, 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific, only on Spaced Out Radio.
Miss most of tonight's show? Don't worry, you didn't miss a thing. You can head to our website where you can download the podcast at spacedoutradio.com. Now, back to tonight's show. Here's Dave Scott. Full of action tonight on Space Out Radio Land from the Space Out Radio chat room and paranormal into the night. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Always appreciate the support and love. Hey, we do this thing seven days a week. Meet my show, Space Out Radio, Monday through Friday. Uncle Jimbo, James Tyson, comes in for Space Out Weekend tomorrow and Sunday night. You'll want to check that out. We'll get you a guest as soon as we possibly can. Now, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. You can give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can also ask to join our private Spaced Out Radio group and our other group podcast central. Also, you can follow me on Instagram, Dave Scott S O R, and of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. Now, we bring in our Keith Andrews for the final time tonight. He's our resident ET expert. And I want to start things off with a question from Exogenesis again on our Twitter feed. He's asking, Keith, with all these races of ETs out there and visiting us, is SETI still needed, or are they trying to detect the wrong type of signal? Well, more to the point, they're trying to – it's kind of funny. They are useful, okay? Like SETI does have certain uses. The the fact of the matter is that they are looking for something a lot deeper than local. Because if they were looking for local, uh, well, frankly, it's not that hard to find. But SETI does have, in, in a human standpoint, SETI does have some pretty sophisticated perspectives, but they're looking for something a lot deeper than what's here. Okay. So, you know, are they still useful? Do they still have a purpose? The answer is absolutely yes. Jarhead in the Space Out Radio chat room is asking, are aliens still using Mars as a base or have they abandoned it? Oh, for pity's sakes, Mars is inhabited. It's not exactly a base. The Martokians would kind of, they, they kind of look at that kind of, that question sort of like, well, are humans using the Earth as a base, or have they just abandoned it? Because, I mean, there's only 7 billion people on, on Earth. <laughs> right. Mars isn't exactly a base. Gotcha. The thing, with Mars, the thing with Mars is the population's underground. I have heard that before. I have heard that. When we had Randy Kramer on from the Earth Defense Force, where he said he spent 17 of his 20 years in the military based on Mars, he had stated, as well as a gentleman who goes by the pseudonym Max Steele had stated, that the good guys on Mars are all living underground, and it's the ones that are on the surface that are the ones you really have to worry about. They're kind of nasty. Well, let's face it. Take a look at the territory out there. You know, Mars' surface isn't exactly the most hospitable planet. You know, mm-hmm. but, yeah, it's it's very definitely, well, I call it definite, it's occupied. All right. So, I no, get it to, certainly hasn't yeah. been abandoned. Okay. I want to get to some questions that are coming out of the paranormal into the night uh, forum here for us. Claudia, or pardon me, Nisa is asking, are any of the extraterrestrial species immortal? From human definition, um, Laborian basically would be. Um, the Drakes essentially are. Now, I'm presuming that she's referring to that, that Nisa, that you're referring to them being immortal as in they don't die of old age. And Ultimately, there's a few of them that by that definition are immortal. But due to the circumstances, they don't exactly live forever. Okay, like let's face it, if you have to live on a planet and you outlive the planet, you run into a problem. Okay, you know, so like the most of the, if you look at the elementals, most of them are essentially immortal because all they are, and I do know there is one race 
um, which are literally an electrical spark. They're an electrical charge. And they just plain don't die. Okay, and that's I think that's the closest to an immortal that you'll run into. On the whole, if you've got a physical body, it's going to wear out eventually. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I know you've got a list of, of questions that you're trying to get through. What I don't know is how long said list is. Well, I'm I'm actually uh, having a good snicker here because Jarhead in our Space Out Radio chat room said, I'm glad Matt Damon made it back from his uh, latest movie. Matt Damon always makes it back. It just costs a million lives and millions of dollars to get there, Jarhead. Doesn't matter what movie he's in. So I, I was getting a I was getting a good chuckle out of that. So thank you so much for posting that in the spaced out radio chat room. All right, I have a couple of questions. Uh, we have about I have about five more from Paranormal Into the Night that I've got written down here. A uh, couple from okay. Claudia. There has been. Sure, yeah, there has been notes made that many ET species are mining this planet for energy. Uh, there is a species that seems to revolve ar- around the West Coast that actually flies into volcanoes and takes energy from inside a volcano. What do you know about these species that are coming in here to mine our resources? Well, we, we start with the first issue, ain't yours. Um, number two, yeah, the they're they're pulling through, the ones that go into the into the volcanoes are pulling thermal. They are they are when we talk about mining, let us understand humans mine they decimate an area. When the offworlders mine, on the whole, they take something. They take some of what is being created, and leave the rest to replenish. So when they go in to mine thermal energy from the lava, you know, like from the inside of a volcano, they're not mining as in taking away. They are collecting something much like it would be akin to mining blackberries. You leave the bush intact, but you take the fruit. Okay. When you look at mining the oceans for water particulates, they're not taking more than what is being produced, which means they're leaving enough there for it to continue continue um, replenishing itself. Okay. <laughs> I, I get a kick out of this one. Watchdog, which group of ETs is responsible for planting Bigfoot on our planet? Well, I guess technically you'd call it, they, you would have to say it was the fairy folk, considering they basically built him and it wasn't so much he planted him here as he was evolved from apes with the with the input or with the guidance of the fairy folk over a number of centuries because bigfoot isn't from a different planet it's not from a different dimension it's from here but how does he get on to some well, yeah, Go I, I'm going to de- I'm going to debate the Bigfoot thing because I have seen the shape shifting. Well, I haven't seen it, but I've seen pixelation, and right afterwards, I heard the roar. So, does Bigfoot then, if it does have ET blood in it, shall we say, or DNA, does it have the power, in your estimation, to shape shift, or is it interdimensional? More to the point, they're extreme camouflage. Okay, there are some, you know, first of all, they are, number one, they're not interdimensional, period. They're a physical entity. Um, Number two, can they disappear into the woodlands? The answer is absolutely yes. They have become very good at disappearing into the woodlands. Now, if you look at some of them, Basically, what it really boils down to is they are masters at deception, meaning they can get you to look elsewhere while they disappear. Okay, and frankly, there's humans that can do exactly the same thing. And it looks like they're fading into a into a different world, but in all fairness, they're not. 
And I'm not debating whether you've seen the pixelation and what have you in the photographs. Okay. It's just I happen to have sat around the campfire with the things. Well, more to the point, around the clearing, they don't exactly use a campfire. Something to do with fur really burns well. I disagree with you on that. I have First Nations friends out in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia, and they have actually sat around campfires with Bigfoot. It's a very remote place, and I believe the guy. I 100% oh, I believe, believe the guy. I, I don't doubt they have campfires. Just when I was sitting around the around the clearing with them, it wasn't around a campfire. Exactly. Okay. Well, I had to challenge you there on that one. I had to. No, oh, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Claudia's second question, which I thought was very interesting. Do you know, when it comes to out-of-body experiences, extraterrestrial species have them? Yes, they do. Pretty much on the same frequency the humans do. Um, you know, it depends on the race. Some of them deny them altogether. Some of them thrive on them. It's kind of a varied bag, but the answer is definitively from everything I've heard. Most of the races that have a body in the first place have an OBE, you know, or at least it's reported amongst them. How is that for subtle? <laughs> I'm not used to your answers being that short, so I'm a, I'm a little stunned right now. <laughs> but the questions are coming well, fast and furious here, so uh, you know what? At least you're getting to it. I, I appreciate that, my friend. Not a problem. All right. Next question. I got a pair that come from Nisa at Paranormal okay. Into the Night. Are the Nephilim still here? Only in a sense. Okay, are they here as in in the area? The answer is yes. Are they on the planet? From what I've gathered, the answer is no. Now, I have been, you know, I'm not aware of every square inch of this planet for obvious reasons. Um, but I haven't heard reports of them being actually on the planet. And I certainly haven't run into them here, you know, in, in recent years. That's for certain. And by the way, recent years for me boils down to a few centuries. I remember past lives rather well. You're um, kind of talented, but are we? <laughs> you know, I debate whether that was a talent or a curse. Trust me on that one. <laughs> but, um, but are the Nephilim still in contact? Do they still have their, you know, their connections to it? The answer is, yeah, they do. We'll get to uh, Nisa's second question here, and then you can follow that up by asking Watchdog's next question in the Space Out Radio chat room. Nisa's Absolutely. next question, and and there's a lot of speculation about this over the last five to ten years when it regards into black-eyed children. Are they extraterrestrial, and should we fear them, or are they human hybrids among us? That's sort of a yes, no, and a yes. Um, many of them are hybrids. Okay. Once in a blue moon, you will have a genetic throwback where you may have a pure human with black, with, with black eyes, but the greater majority of the black eyed children are hybrids. Okay. Are they to be feared? No. Okay. Let's just settle for that one because fearing a child and, and rest assured, by the way, a lot of the black-eyed children, um, they call them black-eyed children because of their size, not necessarily their age. Some of those black-eyed children are older than your grandfather. Okay. Um, but are they to be feared? Absolutely not. You know, the, the reality is, they are simply a the, the greater majority of them are actually hybrid, but there are some subtle differences because there's actually two sets. Okay, you've got the hybrids, but there is a race of basically they they would look like black-eyed children, but they're very much a curious race. 
as in they want to know what's going on. Okay, but again, like I said, the, the best way I can put it is you certainly don't have to just categorically fear them because they're black-eyed. No, I, I can okay. understand and appreciate that, Keith, but I guess my follow-up to that is people who have had experiences with black-eyed children are always saying the same things, that these black-eyed kids come up to them and they say, can we come into your house or can we come into your car or can we come into your work? They're always wanting to come in. And for a lot of people, that would be eerie. So what happens if you let them in? Oh, they will do such neat little things. And I guess I should clarify what they're, what they're hybrids of. Um, they are hybrids of the night walkers. Okay. Uh, of the shadow walkers. And the reason that they want in is because they're curious. They want to know what the inside of a car looks like. They want to know what a human house looks like, what it feels like. They want to see what people are doing. In that respect, they're very much children. Okay. They're very curious, very innocent. They're not spies. They're not doing anything wrong. But the logical question that goes hand in hand is I just mentioned they are, most of them are hybrids of something called a shadow walker. Well, shadow walkers, for those of you that are more familiar with the term, would be vampires. And they are real. The thing with the, with the black-eyed children is they don't have the bloodlust. They don't have the requirement. So they're not coming in hunting. They're coming in because they want to know what it looks like. But they did end up with that carryover of they won't enter a building if they're not invited. It's got nothing to do with power. It's got to do with respect. That and the fact that they got so used to being told you can't go anywhere without being invited. They kind of grow up that way. But are they anything to fear? Are they something that is out to hurt anybody? The answer is no. I have a question uh, from okay. Bill out of Yeah. I have a question from Bill in Paranormal End of the Night. Can they travel easily from our universe into a multiverse? Which uh, can which ray or is that just can any of them? Can any of them when they're traveling? Are they are they multiversal, if that's even a word? Well, quite frankly, it works for me. Um, it's a it's a short form of multi universal, and therefore, yeah, it's an abbreviation. But some of the races can. But something we must understand is yes, they can travel into another dimension or not into another dimension, but into, a, into another of the, of the multiverse, but they cannot travel backwards in time. Even going into another universe, they cannot skip backwards in time. So let's say leave 2016, jump into a different multiverse, and jump back into, say, 1952 cannot go back in time you can go forward even going across into another domain into another multiverse right into another universe you can go forward in time but you cannot go backwards okay you can go back to look you just can't go back and do anything so okay. is, time tra is time travel then possible for us here on Earth? Only forward, not backwards. Okay, you cannot go back in time, and there is a reason for not being able to go back in time. Okay, but the ultimately it boils down to this. If you go back in time, you will be shunted sideways and you won't be in, if you go back and you change something in the past, change the world you're in. Okay. If you go forward in time, bearing in mind you can't come back, there's going to be a period of time over years or centuries even where there's no record of you until you all of a sudden surface again. 
Interesting. Oh, okay. I have yeah, a, another question. Go ahead. Sorry, um, Keith. I, I just want to jump back. I just want to jump back and get Watchdog's question. Are they using the sun for energy propulsion? And the answer is some of them do. There's a fleet actually parked inside the sun's corona that is directly using the sun's energy as propulsion. Has to do with the with the with the electron drive, which by the way was built by by the Atlanteans. Cool. And there was photographs a couple of months ago that came out in regards to that where I believe uh, one of our satellites had taken photos which showed almost like UFOs docked near the sun, probably almost the size of our planet. They were that big, in, or continents yep. at least, that were seemed to be filling up, and then they had them recorded where they were leaving as well. So it was very interesting to see those. Watchdog also wants to know the lotto numbers for tomorrow night, and I'm wondering if I won tonight, but uh, we'll we'll ask you that after the show. Um, I do yeah, have a question. <laughs> if I knew the lottery numbers, trust me, I wouldn't be working. You would still be doing this. You're addicted to this. Oh. I do want to. I I want to get another question from Claudia in there, Keith, because <laughs> this is a question that's been uh, an itch she has needed to scratch for a long time. So, Claudia is asking. Do aliens enter into your dreams because it is easier to accept them? She's saying that she has boarded ships in her dreams, and she has had downloads in her dreams as well. And the answer to that is yes. They absolutely do, especially the telepaths, because very much it's easier for people to actually accept them because people will turn around and go, oh, it was just a dream. It was trippy, but it was just a dream. And therefore, they don't have the logical imperative that they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, that being said, no, they don't make people do stupid things. People do those all on their own. Yes, it's hard to put a human idealism on an extraterrestrial download, that is for sure. I know when I had mine in March of 2014, way before I started this show, it was pretty odd for me because it seemed like they were taking so much away, but they really wanted me to use my own intuition and my own feelings on everything, which... uh, totally blew my mind and I didn't really understand it. But what I did know was two weeks later, I had a close encounter of a third kind with a landing right in front of me about 150 yards away. And then five days after that, seeing my first extraterrestrial. So if you do pay attention to the signs that are coming and the downloads that are coming, you are definitely, definitely going to be able to see things a lot more clear. Would you agree with that, Keith? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, because you you get the information of what you're trying to see, if you will. You know, so absolutely, the the downloads can become extremely beneficial. You know, the the whole trick to it is remembering that you still have to be able to integrate it into your own life to be able to work with it. That's hard for a lot of people, though. Oh, heavens yeah. A lot of humans have this brilliant idea. If they can't see it, it doesn't exist. And then those same humans believe in God. <laughs> and the ones that don't believe in God believe in oxygen. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that's just a little Keith, thought for you. <laughs> Keith, we have approximately about five minutes left with you. Actually, about three minutes left. What do you tell, and I'm going to finish this up because I I want to uh, thank you for everything that you did tonight, but I know I'm getting hounded by a few skeptics out there on on one of these forums that I'm on, and I try to ignore it and everything, and they keep saying, we don't believe this alien stuff because we have no proof, and they refuse to take human experiences as proof, even though in a court of law, it would be very submissible on evidence. 
What do you tell those types of skeptics that are so hardcore in the five senses that they can't even open up their mind to this? What do they consider proof? Would be the first question I ask. An actual landing on the White House lawn or on their lawn or something along those lines. The government to come out and say, yes, they are here, they are real. That won't be proof. Um, And the reason I say that is because with modern technology, number one, President Obama, from what I understand, has just come out and unclassified, declassified so many of the reports. And the first thing that people did was turn around and go, it's some government ploy to add to the cover-up. Okay. The people that are refusing to look at the evidence of human experience are not going to believe it until they end up in some sort of a situation like, for instance, at a a tech like dinner table, at which point it may not be a good time to find out. You know, the, the people that are that hardcore are, quite frankly, beyond the capacity of accepting proof. And therefore, myself, I look at them and go, well, if you're not willing to accept any input as proof, you're going to have to wait for it. Okay. People, there are people that argue the point, the they want scientific proof. Well, here's scientific proof. Okay. Scientific proof says the bumblebee, that funny little black and yellow fuzzy thing. Scientific proof says it cannot fly. Physically, it is not possible. The, the wind displacement, the strength of it, the repetition of the wings, that thing can't fly. That's scientific proof. Except nobody told the bumblebee because it's doing a pretty good job of flying. I hear you there, my friend. And you know what? I'm going to have to end that question at this time, Keith. Thank you so much once again for being on Spaced Out Radio tonight. Always a pleasure to have you on on the first Friday of every month, and we look forward to doing it again next month on March 4th. Absolutely. Looking forward to it there, Dave. And thanks again to you and especially to all of your wonderful guests with with the wonderful listeners and the great questions. Wonderful. And Keith, can you let people quickly know where they can get a hold of you for further questions or maybe a, a personal reading? The the easiest way to get a hold of me is look me up on innervoiceenterprises.com or on my Facebook page, Inner Voice Enterprises, or innervoiceenterprises at yahoo.ca, which is my own, that's my business email, and I tend to be in it on a on quite a regular basis. Awesome. That's the easiest Thank way to find me. And, of course, through you is easy. Yeah, I'll, I'll hook you up. Not a problem. Keith, thank you so much, buddy. We'll talk to you next month. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Dave. Do you have a topic or guest you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Email us, dave at spacedoutradio.com. Send us a quick message on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio or a message on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio. Once again, here's Dave Scott. I want to thank our Keith Andrews for being on the show tonight. I love it when he's on. And you guys in Paranormal Into the Night and in the Spaced Out Radio chat room had your A-games on as well. Thank you so much. This is the way we like to do this show. Just open it up to you because it's about you guys. We do it a little bit differently with Keith. That's the way he likes it. That's the way I like it. And I know that's the way you out in audience land like it as well. Thank you so much for being a part. Hey, I'm stepping out for the weekend. Uncle Jimbo James Tyson is in the cabin. I'm off into the wilderness. I'm going to relax, chill out, have some fun, enjoy it. So I'll talk to you on Monday. Remember, follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio Show. Give it a like. Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for tuning in live with us. I personally will talk to you on Monday night. Take care.